Thank you all for tuning in for our June Research Spotlight webinar. I'm Dr. Sarah Hernandez, the Director of Research Programs at the Hereditary Disease Foundation. I want to start by thanking our sponsors for this webinar, Neurocrim Biosciences, Spark Therapeutics, and the Parvin Foundation. Also, thank you to everyone who has donated to the HDF to support research and to all of you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. I'm happy to introduce everyone to three HDF-supported young investigators. The HDF was delighted to be able to send these same three young researchers to the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization World Congress this past March. They were able to meet young members of the Huntington's disease community and connect with them by talking about their research. Today, they'll each share their work for which they received an HDF postdoctoral fellowship. We are joined today by Dr. Isabella Pena, Dr. Vasa Magadi, and Dr. Terence Gall Duncan. Our first speaker will be Dr. Pena, who recently started her own laboratory at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, the University of Ottawa in Canada. She carried out her postdoctoral work with Professor Miriam Heyman at MIT, where her work focused on investigating mitochondrial vulnerabilities in the most affected neuronal cell type in Huntington's, medium spiny neurons. She developed a technique that allows for isolation and biochemical profiling of mitochondria isolated specifically from those cells, and she hopes the data generated from the study will pave the path for understanding metabolic alterations in HD and potentially non-invasive interventions. Our second speaker is Dr. Magadi, who is a postdoctoral fellow in Walker Jackson's laboratory at Linköping University in Sweden. He received a Marie Curie fellowship and he obtained a PhD in neurosciences from the University of Crete in Greece. His current research focuses on neurodegenerative diseases, including Huntington's disease. He's working to develop mouse models using CRISPR and several biochemical techniques, including next generation sequencing to understand the disease and find possible treatments for Huntington's. Our third speaker is Dr. Gall Duncan, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Chris Christopher Pearson at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. He received his PhD in molecular genetics from the University of Toronto. Terence's work focuses on understanding mechanisms of somatic repeat expansion and on characterizing small molecules that can hijack these mechanisms to promote repeat contractions. By inducing these contractions, Terence hopes that these small molecules will shorten or correct the expansion mutation, leading to improved motor and behavioral symptoms in HD. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm excited to hear about your work. Before we start, I want to remind our audience um, that they will have an opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A box throughout the talk. We are going to have both HD family members as well as researchers on the call, so feel free to ask both technical or non-technical questions. We should have about 20 minutes at the end for a Q&A with our speakers, so type your questions in as you think of them so that you don't forget, and we will address as many of those as we can at the end. Thank you all again so much for being here, and I'll start by passing it over to Isa. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Sarah and the HDF for the invitation, also for funding your work. So I'm going to share my screen and show a little bit of what the science that we've been doing in the lab. So this is the work done in the in Professor Heyman's lab, Miriam Heyman at MIT, where I've been uh, a postdoc, and I just now transitioned to start my own lab in Ottawa in Canada. So today I'm gonna to talk about how we've been interested on investigating mitochondrial defects in the most vulnerable neurons in Huntington's disease, the medium spiny neurons. It's something that is very remarkable. And I think for many of us that study HD is that despite all the cells in the body of a Huntington's disease patient have the CAG repeat mutations, not all cells suffer equally, especially in the brain, not all neurons are affected equally. And this is something that really uh, attracted my curiosity, that if you look into the brain of a person that is affected by Huntington's disease, you see a very specific atrophy of cerebral tissue in the basal ganglia, specifically in the striatum. It's a specific region in the midbrain. And this type of uh, tissue is full of a specific neuron called medium spiny neuron. So this is the main neuronal type in this region. And that's the main neuronal type that degenerate in Huntington's disease. So not all neuronal cells are affected equally in this disease. 
and why, right? That's the main question. Why medium spiny neurons? What is so special about those neurons that make them suffer the most in the disease? And this uh, particular aspect of uh, specific vulnerability of a cell type is not uh, uncommon in, in biology. So in fact, we see the generation of medium spiny neurons in Huntington's disease, but we also see the generation of motor neurons in ALS and pyramidal neurons in Alzheimer's disease. So all the neurodegenerative diseases also has these features of having a specific cell types that degenerate in, in not all the cells. But in the case of HD, what is the molecular basis of MSN selective vulnerability? What makes those neurons be so vulnerable in HD? And that's been the focus of our lab for many years. So the Hamer lab has been trying to understand why those neurons, you know, if you think about a Lego here of a brain full of several different cell types, several neurons, why those neurons, let's say the, the green here are the neurons that degenerate. So to do that and considering the brain as you know, a mix of so many types of cells and pathways, uh, there are ways to do this molecularly to separate each of the cell types and an analyze them transcriptionally, analyze their RNA data. So this is a technique called single cell RNA-seq. Another technique that our lab has been employing is to purify uh, trip, uh, purify uh, use a technique called TRAP, purify the ribosomes that are bound to RNA and then sequence this RNA. Those will be the translational uh, uh, RNAs. So we can do this and distinguish the cell types in the brain and try to understand what is unique in the MSNs compared to the other, other cell types. So a brilliant postdoc in our lab, Hesian Lee, which is, which is also an HDF, HDF fellow, has done a lot of studies on this type of single nuclear RNA-seq and also TRAP-seq both in mice and also in, in human tissue. And she found a lot of very interesting things. One of them is that MSNs, the medium spiny neurons, have a lot of mitochondrial dysregulation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what mitochondria is. But in this study published in 2020 by our lab, she showed both in mouse models and also in human tissue that there's a lot of mitochondrial problems in the brain, specifically in the medium spiny neurons. And not only that, not only that they have an energy failure, they also have a release of mitochondrial DNA uniquely in HD, in AMSNs. So I'm talking about mitochondria now. And mitochondria, if people don't know what they are, those are little organelles that live inside the cell. So here's a little drawing of a cell, and that's the mitochondria. It's a tiny little subcellular compartmentalization that is composed by several membranes, and I'm gonna show here some. They produce ATP, which is our energy molecule of our cell. And we need this ATP to, to, to have our cells and our neurons firing and connecting and communicating. So mitochondria have an outer membrane, mitochondria have an inner membrane shown here. They have a matrix where a lot of enzymes exist and this intermembrane space. And all those compartments are crucial for the function of the mitochondria. And mitochondria is made of a lot of molecules, protein, DNA, lipids, and et cetera. And one of the most common set of molecules is shown here. This is the electron transfer complex, the ETC, that catalyze the synthesis of ATP in the cell in the end on the complex five. So just a little diagram of what is a mitochondria and why it's important for us to know what are the components of the mitochondria. Because the mitochondrial contents of a cell vary considerably you know, based on different tissues, different disease states, metabolic, and also growth conditions. And in the case of MSNs, one can hypothesize is that there's something special about their mitochondrial contents that render them vulnerable to disease. And that's one of the things that I am very interested to study in this project. So we hypothesize that by creating a technique to isolate the mitochondria, the subcellular compartment, only from the MSNs, only from the medium spiny neurons in HD, we can learn about the molecular signatures of the disease that make those cells so vulnerable. And, but to truly investigate the MSN mitochondria, I needed to create an approach to purify the mitochondria from that cell type compared to other cell types. So think about the brain as a melange of cell types, right? We have so many types of neurons. We have oligodendrocytes. We have astrocytes. We have so many other types of cells. But I want to get at mitochondria only from that one particular neuron. So how do we do that? And that's what I had to come up with the technique. And so with this new technique to isolate mitochondria, we can purify 
the, the mitochondria from the mouse models of HD and also wild type models, the control mice, and perform a proteomic profiling to identify organellar dysfunctional markers, what are the composition of the proteins in all those mitochondria, maybe we can find new biomarkers and create a catalog of neuronal proteins that characterize MSN mitochondria in health and disease. So the technique that we created is uh, basically based, is based on genetics. So we engineered the tag, uh, mitochondria little label. So we label the mitochondria in their outer membrane shown here with the GFP, this little green barrel, and also an HA tag. And we put this tag inside an AV, a virus. So this virus is used to infect the mice. And because we have a promoter that is uh, specific to the MSNs that expresses you know, preferentially in the medium spiny neurons, we can direct the expression of this labeled mitochondria on the medial spiny neurons. So by using AAV infection. And then we inject those AAVs, those viruses in the, in the mice. And this leads to the labeling of the mitochondria, both in the control mice and also in the Huntington's disease models. So we've been using the ZQ175s, which is a, a knocking mouse model, and also the R62 mouse model, which is a very aggressive uh, model of Huntington's disease that expresses the exon one with the polycule repeats. And then the tagged mitochondria are gonna be seen in the, in the neurons. And then we use a two-step approach to purify the mitochondria with high purity and avoid getting all the components of the neurons, such as membranes, synaptosomes, peroxisomes, ER, lysosomes, there's so many other cellular compartments that we have to separate. So we separate that, get the mitochondria, and then we use a magnetic bead to purify only the mitochondria that have the little green tag that I'm showing here, the green tag that we engineered with the AAV. And then once we purify all the mitochondria from the medium spanning neurons only, we can do molecular profiling, for example, by proteomics mass spectrometry. And here's just an, an example of this uh, uh, AAV virus that we uh, created in the lab. So we can see that this is the region of the, of the mouse brain that encompass the striatum. So that's shown here that we can really label the striatum in, in both in the dorsal and the ventral striatum. And with the tag, we can see in, in pink here is the HA, which is the, the little tag in the mitochondria. And it labels the entirety of the mitochondria around the cell bodies and also in the, in the axonal projections in the striatum. So then we can do this whole protocol that I mentioned. So, you know, we inject the mouse with the mitotag virus, and then the mouse expresses the mitotag virus in the brain, in the striatum, and then we, we dissect the striatum, get the, the mitochondria doing this first step of purification using this per call gradient, and then we'll do the purification and by using the immunoprecipitation that I mentioned. And then here we, we see a Western blot. So this is just a way to separate the proteins that we got. And we can see the enrichment of the mitochondrial proteins in this mitochondrial isolates of the medium spiny neurons. So with that, we use these proteins to do proteomics, and we've been doing a lot of proteomics assays, and you know, characterizing all the proteins in the medium spiny neurons in wild type versus HD mice. Not only that, but we also been doing uh, some physiology experiments, doing, for example, respiration of the mitochondria from the wild type mice and the Huntington's disease mice, and we again see this uh, drastic reduction in the complex two, for example, linked respiration in ZQ one seventy five mice. So those are six months old symptomatic mice, and from all the proteins that we see, we're seeing a lot of very interesting changes. I'm not gonna go through data here, but just to mention some brief overviews, we see a lot of instances of energy metabolism failure. So we think that the mitochondria of those neurons, they're having some problems to convert you know, carbon into energy in the neurons. And this leads to some sort of energy metabolism failure. Some of those proteins that we find they're super downregulated in the Huntington's disease mitochondria, they are actually druggable pathways. So there are drugs that can modulate those pathways that seem to be missing in the Huntington's disease mitochondria. At least in mice, we'd have to still see if those pathways exist in also in humans. And, and I think that as, as a result of this energy metabolism failure, there's some metabolic rewiring. So the neuron is trying to compensate this lack of energy of the mitochondria in the medium spiny neurons. So they activate some other pathways that shouldn't be activated in neurons. And those are also very interesting aspects of this study. 
And again, as I mentioned, there's some respiration defects of the mitochondria in the medium spiny neurons in HD. So we have a lot of uh, new technology that we developed that allow purification of the striatal mitochondria uh, from the medium spiny neurons in Huntington's disease mice. There's a lot of proteomic studies that are ongoing, and I hope to be able to share this database very soon in the form of a publication to the community. And we have observed a lot of important protein changes in the medium spiny neuron mitochondria that may suggest a very important energy failure in HD neurons. And there are several therapeutic approaches that may uh, be possible for the future to try to activate those missing pathways in the mitochondria in the medium spiny neurons, and those could be future focus to study. So I'd like to thank everybody from my lab. It's been, it, was, it was really a pleasure to work with uh, Miriam Heyman. So she's a fantastic mentor and everybody in the lab. And thank you to the HDF for the, for the funding and all the amazing community that you guys fostered. Thank you guys. I would like to thank HDF uh, for funding this project. And I'm, my, our lab is based in Sweden. So I would like to introduce um, brain cell types and human body, for example. So if you zoom into a brain, brain not only contains neurons, it also contains several other cell types. Some of the main cell types are listed here, such as astrocytes, microglia, and oligodendrocytes. For this presentation, I will be focusing mostly on the microglia because this is a, of the interest of our project, for example. So what do these microglia do? So when you, have when you have a developing brain, these are the two neurons, for example, this is called a synapse. When you have these two neurons uh, during the development, microglia, what they do is that they uh, discard or delete all the synapses or the dead bodies produced from these cells. So in adult brain or in the mature brain, these microglia are stable, maintain stable connections. They are like a, checking out what's happening around the surroundings. So once you have a neurodegeneration, what happens to these microglia? They become active and they start um, synapses and the dead uh, neurons, they start to degenerate these. And up to some point, these microglia are uh, useful, what they do, the job is very important. When, but however, when, when it's overactivated, that's bad for some, some of the uh, functions in the brain, for example. So if you zoom in in any of these cells, for example, you already heard uh, you have multiple cellular components, such as mitochondria, which you heard from Isabella, that these are the energy powerhouse of the cell. They produce energy for the cell. And you also have a nuclear, uh, which contains the genetic material, which is called DNA. You're going to hear from Terence talking about what is DNA and what the chromatin does. And then for this presentation, I will be focusing only, mostly on the ribosomes. So what are ribosomes, for example? So you have information stored in DNA, which is used to make RNA molecule. And then from this RNA, you can you make a lot of proteins. For example, approximately around 20,000 genes, you can make up to 80,000 to 400,000 proteins, different kinds of proteins. So why do cells do this? I'll talk to you in a bit, in a couple of slides. So now what is happening, when you have these mRNA, ribosomes bind to these mRNA, for example, you have a small ribosomal subunit which binds to mRNA first, and then it recruits a larger subunit of the ribosome to translate this information which is in mRNA into a functional protein. So ribosomes are the workplace or the machineries for making proteins in the cell, and they are built up of four ribosomal RNAs and several ribosomal proteins, up to 80 ribosomal proteins. So now what is typically known about these ribosomes is that everybody thought it's ubiquitous, and invariant, meaning that all cells expresses equally across all tissues. But that's not true. From previous work from the lab, we showed that within the brain region, different parts of the brain region, for example, cortex, all these ribosomal proteins, they are not completely equal. They are not straight line. They change between regions. For example, in the cerebellum, some of the ribosomal proteins drop down to almost zero negligible amounts. And then in some of the regions, it's highly expressed. We can also show that in a brain slice of a mouse tissue, for example, one of these ribosomal protein called RPL26 is highly expressed in one of these neuronal cell types called Purkinje cells, whereas RPS21 is almost expressed all over the uh, tissue, all over the brain slice, for example. So this is very strange. I mean, if you talk to anybody, people would ignore this information that ribosomal proteins are supposed to be 
uh, invariant in all cases, but this is not the case. And this is a very new uh, subject of uh, work. So while we were studying these things, we also found one important gene, which I'm gonna introduce to you today. It's a ribosomal protein S24. So S24, this gene contains seven exons and in between exons, there are introns. What are exons and introns? Exons carry the information to make the proteins, whereas introns are from the DNA, which do not carry any information from the protein. They need to be clipped off. So, and that process is called splicing. So what happens, imagine, so when you clip off all the unnecessary information from this RNA, you join all these exons, one to seven, in this case, in this gene, you make a protein with the three lysines, ending with three lysines, okay? So now if you skip exon five, you make another form of protein, which ends with two lysines in the end of the protein. So then if you skip five and six isoforms, you make another protein, which is ends with PKE. So why do cells do this? So imagine you have one gene and it can make three different proteins. It might be doing the same function or sometimes even completely different function. So that's how cell make up these things and it's evolutionary uh, aspects. So now this gene makes three major isoforms and three different protein ends. So what is important about this gene is that this PKE isoform is not expressed in healthy brain. However, it is induced in the neurodegeneration, especially in Huntington's disease as well. So now that caught us, uh, uh, caught our attention, and then we started to study this gene. Why is it happening? Why, is, why does the disease express this splice variant? So now to do that, we developed a few tools in order to measure RNA, for example. As cells which expresses this isoform, you can detect that. When you differentiate these cells, these are not neurons, these are uh, immature cell types which mature into neurons. Once they differentiate, once they become neurons, for example, they lose these isoforms, similar to brain, which do not express this isoform. So there is no RNA expression. So now we can measure RNA and we have our tools to detect that. So we also developed antibody to develop antibody specifically to bind only to this specific isoform, but not to other two isoforms, for example. So now we validated this antibody in a cell culture grown in cells grown in the lab. So once you express uh, cells containing PKE isoform, only then you can detect this band, which you can see here. But in none of the cells which do not express PKE form, you can detect this. So now we have all, both tools to detect RNA as well as protein. So what we did further with this antibody is that we stained mouse tissue brain, brain tissues with this specific antibody. As you can see in controlled brain tissue, you don't see expression of the PKE isoform whatsoever. So now what happens in Huntington's disease, you can mimic human disease, Huntington's disease in the mouse model, and you can start seeing the expression of this specific isoform, which is shown in pink color here. So now I told, talked about this is happening in the mouse tissue, uh, mouse gen uh, genome. So is this the case also in humans, for example? So if you want to test that, we also st uh, stained for uh, samples obtained from a healthy individual brain tissue, a section of a brain. And in control individuals, you don't see the expression of this isoform. Whereas in uh, Huntington's disease uh, brain tissue, you can see the expression of this protein uh, form. So what we believe that the cells express this isoform are microglia and uh, monocytes, which are kind of, microglia are the immune cells of the brain. They kind of um, um, try to protect the brain from uh, all the inflammation and everything. So now, in order to study the function of these protein, so now we know that one of the ribosomal subunit, the smaller subunit express either 2K isoform or a PKE isoform. Does this make two same kind of apple or does it make a different kind of apple or it does make completely a different or orange, for example? So how different are these two functionally? That's what we want to address. So now to do that, we made a cell, we grew cells and we, uh, transfected plasmids containing, like you can put DNA inside these cells, which contains either 2K or PKE isoform, for example. So now with that, we after that, we collected these uh, RNA molecule and we did next generation sequencing. With that, what you can see is that ribosomal protein RPS24 binds to ribosomal protein genes and SNO RNAs. These two things are responsible for ribosome biogenesis. What does that mean? They are responsible for making these ribosomal complex in order to make proteins from these RNAs. And it's very important 
molecule, for example. So apart from that, we also found a very important thing. So is that the between PKE and 2K, we see differences in genes which they regulate. For example, cellular migration and cytoskeleton regulation. What does that mean, cellular migration and cytoskeleton? Is so now at least we know that these two ribosomes are slightly different, but they are not the same. Uh, they are not completely different, at least. So now I'm going to talk about what is the um, what does cellular migration and cytoskeleton regulation means. So now while we got this information, uh, we also found in the literature study that so the cancer cells, the tumor cells which migrate and metastasize, they use this ribosome biogenesis as a, a way to move between within the cellular compartments or within uh, tissue, for example. So, so what, does, what, what happens is that it's not only these ribosomes not only make proteins, but they are also do something not so known so far. This is a very new topic or, or, or current topic, actually. So now what we believe is that in normal microglia, you have uh, um, RPS24 without the PKE expression. But in Huntington microglia, especially in the leading front of this uh, Huntington uh, microglia, what happens is that you have a RPS24 PKE induction and this leads to ribosome biogenesis. Because of this ribosome biogenesis, it, it makes the cell motile. For example, it doesn't have to move from one region to another region of a brain. While sitting there, it can extend its arms and try to um, remove the degraded uh, uh, neurons, for example. So now, uh, in order to study in vivo, I mean, meaning how, what happens with the Huntington's disease. So what we did is that using a CRISPR line, we made a humble mouse model in which either we can decrease the expression of PKE, we deleted PKE, for example, it decreases the expression of this isoform, or we can make or increase the expression of this specific isoform by deleting the other two protein forms, let's say. So now we have tested these two isoforms in a mouse model, and if you can also do this in a specific cell type of a brain, you can also do it in neurons, glia or any kind of cell types. So when you do that, you, we have already seen that this mouse is working as it's supposed to work, for example. So what we want to do with this mouse model is that we want to combine this with the Huntington's disease mouse model, which we have been using in the lab. And we also have uh, other, two cell, uh, other two models, for example, Drosophila models, and also cell culture models. We want to study what happens when you control these isoform. Does it increase the disease or decrease the disease if you increase the PKE isoform or not? That's what we are trying to address. So we will perform some kind of behavior studies, which is known to cause, uh, Huntington's disease is known to cause. And we also study neuropathology, as well as in the cell culture model, we will also study gene expression studies. So this, this project is in an infancy, and then I would like to add more uh, as soon as we get more data from this. So now with that, I would like to summarize my, our findings. For example, uh, what, what I've shown you is that RPS24 PKE is induced specifically in Huntington's disease, but not in control animals or in human samples, for example. So the cell type being affected are the microglia and the monocytes. And then RPS24 plays an important role in ribosome biogenesis. I mean, this might uh, lead to microglia motility, for example. So that's what we believe, but we need proof of that. And then we also hypothesize that uh, this might be neuroprotective. In that case, if it's a new mechanism that we could control neuroinflammation in this Huntington's disease, for example. So with that, I would like to thank all the group members of the Walker Jackson, as well as the people who were involved in this uh, research work. And I would like to especially thank HDF for funding this project. Thank you all for listening to the talk. Hi, everyone. My name is Terence. Um, I'm from Christopher Pearson's lab at the University of Toronto. And today I'm going to be talking to you um, about a small molecule that we've been developing in the lab to, develop, to treat Huntington's disease. Okay. So, uh, as you all know, Huntington's disease is caused by expansions of this repetitive CAG repeat tract within the Huntington uh, gene. This gene gives rise to an expanded protein product, which tends to form these very clumpy toxic aggregates, toxic aggregates that you can see in uh, the neurons of Huntington mice and patients. These aggregates um, tend to lead to neuronal dysfunction, kind of gumming up the works in these neurons. And this ultimately leads to neuroinflammation within the brain tissues, 
and uh, together these will compound to uh, mediate neurodegeneration. And so the Huntington um, expansion mutation is really unusual because although individuals are born with this repeat expansion, it actually gets larger and larger in patients um, as they age. And so, for example, someone who's born with 40 CAG repeats, they can accrue up to hundreds or even thousands more CAG repeats within their most affected neurons and tissue. And so since we know that the age of onset as well as disease progression and severity are directly linked with how large um, the repeat is, uh, we think that these thematic expansions um, are really important for mediating disease. And so if we can figure out a way to stop or even reverse this process, potentially that would be therapeutically beneficial in HD. And so the molecular mechanisms that control repeat expansions are still uh, relatively um, understudied in the field. We don't really know how this process is happening, but we do know that these um, structures that form within the repeat tract are really important. So essentially what happens is, is when the repeat expansion is uh, too large, it will start to fold in on itself to form these really unusual flipped DNA structures here. These structures don't occur in uh, non-expanded repeats. So we um, think that this is a disease associated um, kind of structure that's forming. These structures are identified by DNA repair proteins, which attempt to fix these structures, but in doing so, they typically make mistakes and they end up adding additional CAG repeat units. And so this is how we think that um, repeat expansions are occurring in patient uh, cells. And so in our lab, we're really interested in seeing if we can actually target this process uh, so that we can inhibit somatic expansions and potentially treat disease. Um, so keeping that in mind, we worked with our collaborator, Dr. Kazuhiko Nakatani, who developed a small molecule called nasiridine as a quinolone. Uh, and I'll be referring to this molecule as NA during my talk. Um, NA was designed to specifically bind to these flipped CAG structures that I just told you about, and it kind of stabilizes the structure. But in addition to that, we also showed that the um, molecule can basically prevent those DNA repair proteins that I was talking about from accessing the flip out and leading to expansion. So we are really interested in testing um, if this small molecule was actually uh, going to be useful in treating disease. So we wanted to see its effect on thematic instability in an HD mouse model. So what we did was we took our mouse model and we injected either half of the brain with saline, so just salt water, or half of the brain with Na plus saline, our small molecule. And then we uh, looked at the repeat sizes that were occurring in each half of the brain to see what the effect was. So here, what I'm showing you is just a scan that um, basically each of these peaks here corresponds to the frequency of that repeat size within the tissue. So you can see here that in the saline treated mice, um, although these mice inherit about 160 CAG repeats, uh, the vast majority of their cells in their brain, um, typically neurons, have expanded to be much larger than 160, with some cells showing upwards of 170 and 190 CAG repeats. So there's quite a lot of thematic instability going on in the brains of these mice. In contrast, when we look at the mice that we treated with NA, you can see here that the vast majority of these thematic expansion events have actually been completely inhibited. And very exciting for us was the fact that most of the neurons actually showed a repeat size that was smaller than the repeat size that these mice inherited at birth. Um, and so this suggested that our molecule was able to actually make the repeat smaller than what it was um, when these mice were born. And so on average, we saw that um, about 22 of these additional CAG repeats were being prevented from being added. And on average, we saw about seven CAG repeats being removed from the uh, from the modal peak here. And so um, based on this data, we could conclude that our molecule is both able to stop thematic expansion, as well as reverse the thematic expansion process to elicit these uh, contraction events that you can see here. And so after we uh, saw that we're having an effect on the DNA repeat sizes in the mouse brains, 
we then wanted to see if our small molecule was able to change any of those um, toxic aggregate phenotypes that I showed you earlier. So here, what I'm uh, showing you is the saline treated um, mouse brain, where you can see here that in all of the neurons, which are these little blue uh, circles here, they seem to show these um, mutant conditin aggregates, which are these red spots that you can see in all the neurons. These aggregates are pretty large and pretty bright, suggesting that they're uh, fairly large in size. When we looked at the NA treated brain, however, um, you can essentially see here that almost all of the neurons have lost their aggregates. And the aggregates that do remain are typically smaller in size and they're less intense in, in, uh, in their fluorescent intensity. And so this suggests to us that our molecule is basically able to stop aggregates from forming as well as limit the toxicity that these aggregates elicit by making them smaller in size. So they form uh, more slowly. Um, and so all of the work that I just showed you was published in 2020 in Nature Genetics. But since then, we've been really interested in looking at the effects of NA on motor symptoms, especially in HD mice. And so all of the work that I'm gonna show you from this point on is completely unpublished data. Um, so to start with, we first looked to see if our small molecule could affect general locomotion by conducting the open field test. Uh, basically, the way this assay works is we just, um, it's very simple. We take our mice, we put it on, put them onto an open field, and then we have a camera which tracks their movement as they move across the open field. And you can get measures of, you know, how much distance these mice traveled uh, while they're in the open field, where they choose to explore, and things like that. So here, what I'm showing you is a heat map of where these mice uh, travel. So essentially, any of the spots that are not blue on this heat map are where the mice have moved in the open field. And the more red um, that the uh, pixels are, that's where the mice typically spend the most amount of time. So here you can see that in unaffected mice, they travel quite a lot, uh, a lot of distance within the open field, about 500 centimeters. Um, sorry, 5,000 centimeters over the course of the experiment. When we look at HD mice, however, you can see that uh, these mice do not move a lot within the open field, and they tend to stay in the area where we actually put them into the open field to start with. And so to us, this suggests that um, these HD mice really have a hard time moving around the open field, which is what we'd expect to see. However, when we look at the NA treated um, HD mice, you can see that these mice do move a significantly higher amount than the saline treated HD mice. They move um, um, more distance overall, and this is quantified here on the right hand side, but they also tend to go into the corners where mice, where mice um, typically like to go as well. Um, next, we wanted to see if our small molecule could uh, improve balance and coordination issues in the HD mice, since we know that this is a cardinal feature of HD. For this, we use the um, rotor rod assay. And essentially the way this assay works is we have a rod that's rotating, and then we place our mice onto the rod. Um, at some point, the mice will fall, uh, typically when they're too tired or they don't wanna uh, move anymore, um, they'll typically just fall off the rod. And we can measure the time that it takes for the mice to fall from the rod as a measure of their ability to stay balanced and uh, coordinate their muscle movement um, on, on this rotating rod. So here you can see that um, in unaffected mice, they typically can stay on the rod for about a uh, hundred seconds or more. Um, but in HD mice, we see this very profound balance and coordination uh, effect where these HD mice, typically they don't stay on the rod very, very long. You put them on and they fall off after a couple of seconds or so. Uh, very exciting for us was that the, the NA treated HD mice were able to stay on this rotating rod for a very long amount of time uh, relative to the saline treated mice. Um, and so they're moving towards the wild type levels, but um, more importantly, they're very highly rescued relative to the saline treated HD mice. And lastly, we wanted to see for motor phenotypes if NA could improve uh, muscle strength in general, this is just general muscle strength. So for this assay, we um, basically put the mice onto this hanging wire that you can see here. And then we just calculate the amount of time that it takes for these mice to fall off of the wire. Um, and this just tests latent, uh, latent stress, latent muscle strength. 
So here you can see that when we do this assay using unaffected mice and the saline treated HD mice, that the HD mice have a um, pretty significant strength um, uh, deficit. They can hold on to the wire for about a third of the time that the unaffected mice can. Um, in contrast to this, we see that the NA treated HD mice are significantly rescued in this ability and that they're able to stay on the um, uh, wire for a significantly longer amount of time, suggesting that NA is able to improve um, their general muscle strength. And so now that we've shown that NA kind of has an effect on all of these different motor symptoms, we then want to see, well, what is the underlying uh, kind of um, effect of NA on neurodegeneration, which we presume would be affecting their all of these different motor phenotypes. Um, and so to address this question, we first looked at neuroinflammation, and we assessed this through a protein called NLRP3, which is a media mediator of neuroinflammation. So here I'm showing you the HD mice mouse brains again, two different regions, the triatum and frontal cortex, where you can see in the saline treated mice, there's elevated levels of NLRP3, NLRP3, suggesting there's more neuroinflammation. However, in the HD treated mice, you can see that this inflammation drops um, significantly in both the stridum and frontal cortex. This is quantified here, where you can see, again, there's the drop in the NLRP3 signal. And when we look at the total number of neurons in the stridum of these mice, you can see that although the saline treated mice show a loss of neurons over um, the 12 weeks that we drew these mice, um, the NA treated uh, HD mice actually showed um, very high levels of neurons, and they were actually indistinguishable from the unaffected mice, suggesting that NA could potentially prevent some of these neurodegenerative effects that are associated with neuroinflammation. And so in summary, um, in our preclinical testing of NA and HD mice, we can show that NA induces contraction, reduces toxic protein aggregates, uh, improves motor symptoms, and limits inflammation, which may limit neurodegeneration in this mouse model. Uh, and with that, I would just like to thank all of the people who are involved in the study, the HDF for supporting my fellowship um, and all of our funding agencies. Um, and I would just like to end with this photo of myself, uh, Vasta and Iza at the um, 2023 HDYO Congress, which we were sent to by the HDF. Uh, I'm really grateful to be part of this community. And um, yeah, thank you for the HDF for giving me this opportunity. Thanks and I'll take any questions now. Amazing. Thank you all so much for sharing your work. I think um, we usually have things kind of grouped by themes and have two presenters for each theme, but this was fascinating because we had three very separate stories about different research that's going on in HD. So it was really exciting to hear what each of you are working on. Um, and as expected, we have a whole lot of questions in the Q&A. So uh, feel free to keep typing those in. If we don't get to all of them, I'll send them to our speakers afterwards. And if they're willing, they can address those with you. Um, but um, we will dive right in. So Isa was busy answering some questions. So if you put a question in the Q&A, check, check the Q&A because she may have answered it if I don't get to it. Um, but I will start uh, with a question for Isa. So it looked like you were in the middle of typing this, Isa. So sorry, I'm going to make you answer it live. But Charlie <laughs> Smith asked. Um, I was about... typing this one right now. <laughs> okay, so maybe you could answer this live, but I'll, I'll read it out so that everyone knows what we're talking about. So Charlie Smith asked, if you ran um, pathway analysis on your, your proteomics to look at differences in your HD versus control in the MSM mitochondrial data that you have? And if so, were there terms other than mitochondrial respiration that you found? I don't want to answer this question entirely now because we're still running the proteomics. So we're still getting the data sets out. But uh, yes, there are all the terms. There are, for example, TC cycle. I think there's some very key aspects of it that seem to be dysfunctional protein search in the membrane, amino acid metabolism, there's several other terms, but I don't want to answer those entirely. Let me, when I finish collecting all the data sets, we can do that. Great, thanks. So this is a question for Vatsa. So from Christopher Pearson, he was wondering if your PKE variant might act differently with age in both HD and control individuals. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yes, that's true. It acts differently between aged mice and uh, uh, a younger mice, we don't see that expression. As the mice age, it starts to express, but it's not the same extent as it would be in the neurodegenerative disease or Huntington's disease, for example. So that we have seen, yes. Thank you. 
Um, so this is a question for Terrence from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they start by saying, great talk. Uh, very interesting and exciting possibilities from, MA, from NA. They ask if NA was a one-time dose or a continuous dose, and they ask how NA was administered. Yeah, so in the data that I showed you for the motor phenotypes, um, we treated the mice continuously for four weeks. Um, so there was a pump that was implanted and it essentially released NA every hour. Um, right now, since everything is preclinical, we're really just looking to see what the maximal effects of NA are. Um, uh, but we are thinking about, you know, IV administration and other forms of administration um, as we kind of develop NA further. Right, thanks. This is a question for Vatsa from Naomi, Naomi Hartop. She says, great talk. Do you know if you have more S24 per cell or more glial cells overall? And is S24 linked in any way with glial activation? Uh, the last part would be true that the S24 activation of PKE might be glial specific. Uh, but for the first question, it's a ribosomal protein, meaning RPS24 is highly expressed compared to any other genes as far as I know. For example, gap DH, it's even higher than a gap DH, for example. So it is highly expressed. I don't know how much highly it might get in, uh, induced in the disease model. I, we are not sure, but we can also measure RPS24 alone as well as different isoforms. So with that, we see a difference in specific isoform. That's what we measure. And I forgot the second question. There was another uh, part in the second. Oh, it just jumped. Um, and is S24 linked in any way with glial activation? Yes, I answered that part, yes. It might, okay. be. It might be the case, yeah. Perfect. Uh, this is a question for Isa from Veronica Brito. She says, very nice talk, Isa. Mitochondrial DNA is a major site for oxidative stress uh, damage and the increasing oxidative stress associated with mutant Huntington. Have you identified in your study altered expression of DNA repair proteins in the mitochondria of MSNs? And then she also asks if you have looked at um, mitochondria from the two different subpopulations of MSNs. Yeah, that's a very good question. So we have um, uh, a dream in the lab. No, I, I left the lab now, so probably going to be the next postdoc in the lab to analyze the two subpopulations of MSN. So uh, we don't have a viral approach to distinguish the two, uh, the direct pattern and the indirect pathway MSNs, but we have genetic models for that. So in this case, we have a genetic mitotag, so the transgenic mouse that uh, is fluxed, and then it expresses a mitotag under the presence of either the Adora 2 a promoter for the indirect pathway neurons, or the DRD1 promoter, which is uh, tagging the mitochondria in the direct pathway MSNs. So in that way, we could, you know, in theory, distinguish the two subpopulations of MSNs. Unfortunately, I had to leave the lab, so I, I couldn't conduct, conduct this work, but hopefully someone in the lab is gonna follow up on that. And on the DNA damage, we are, uh, investigating that. So we also collected DNA from the mitochondria that we purified from the MSNs, and we hope to develop some techniques to investigate uh, if there's DNA damage going on. We haven't, we haven't been able to do that yet, but it's, it's in the, in the makes. And uh, we'll see from the proteomics what it says. Uh, as I said, I'm still collecting. I see a few genes, but I don't want to make claims yet. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Isa. This is a question from Terrence, um, from an anonymous attendee, and I think I'll piggyback this on to a question from Elizabeth Osterland. Um, but someone wants to know if there are side effects from NA, and then Elizabeth Osterland was wondering if there's effects on motor phenotypes in wild-type mice. Okay, great questions. Um, the side effects side, uh, you know, we've done whole genome sequencing of uh, throughout the whole genome, looking at other CAG repeats, which occur naturally in the genome, but are not expanded. We see no effects of NA uh, on the on you know the gene mutation levels or anything like that. So it seems like it's very safe in terms of um, genotoxicity. We also don't see any changes in cell death or uh, morphology changes, anything like that. Um, side effects in terms of you know long term treatments with NA um, systemically, we haven't done those tests yet. Um, Looking at wild type mice, when we put NA into a wild type mouse, we saw no changes um, in their motor phenotypes or their behavioral phenotypes or any um, morphology changes. So it seems like it's overall very safe, at least for all the metrics that we've tested. Um, but you know, we need to do a long term toxicology analysis uh, in that respect. Yeah. Thank you. 
This is a question for Vasa from Takis Prinos. Um, they say ribosomal proteins have recently been shown to have extra ribosomal functions. Do you think the PKE variant may have other functions outside the ribosome? Yeah, that's what we believe. I mean, if you if you talk to experts, um, they wouldn't believe this. Uh, ribosomes were supposed to be invariant and they are supposed to do only protein production. But that's what we are seeing, at least from our next generation sequencing data, it seems like it does non-canonical function. I mean, not what it used to do. I mean, this is a new topic and kind of debating right now. Uh, with the new tools, we might be able to address more. Yeah. Thanks. Here's a question for Isa from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they want to know if mitochondrial dysfunction plays an upstream role in MSN degeneration. And they're curious if you have any idea if the dysfunction is present in Parkinson's disease. Great work, they comment at the end. So I think this is a little bit of an egg and chicken type of question, right? What well, comes first if it's the degeneration of the mitochondria dysfunction itself? But a lot of mouse models are showing early mitochondrial dysfunction, even before the onset of the motor phenotypes in mice. So it is possible that the, the role is preceding the MSN degeneration. That's one of the reasons why we were so interested in diving into the mitochondria. And, and mitochondrial dysfunction is very prevalent in Parkinson's disease. This is also very known. There's a lot of research showing that. Uh, not, I'm not sure if it's going to be the same type of mitochondrial dysfunction, because in, in PD, we have another different cell type that is affected, right? but it's very important for both of the diseases. Thanks, Isa. Here's a question for Terence from Veronica Brito. Um, great talk, she starts. Which would be the best treatment in humans with NA? An acute treatment prior to the onset of somatic CAG expansion or a chronic treatment after onset of CAG expansion? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are thinking about you know, when to start dosing with NA and how. Um, so we are doing tests right now in mice where we treat before symptom onset as well as after symptom onset and see if we can kind of look for differences in um, how the disease progresses or how the mice kind of respond to NA. Um, so I can't comment in humans because we're not, we're not there yet, um, but at least in mouse models, we are thinking about these questions and hopefully that will inform uh, us in the best way to treat humans um, if it's if we come to that, yeah. Exciting. This is a question for Vasa from Christopher Pearson. He starts, great data and great presentation on RPS24 PKE. Thank you. Regarding brain region variations in ribosome expression, it is known that there is variation uh, in ribosomal DNA repeats in human brains. My question is if it is known if this variation differs between brain regions and or if it varies between control and HD brains. That's an interesting question. We we haven't looked into ribosomal DNA at the moment, so I, I cannot answer that question, but it might be possible that, uh, that that could be also possible. But however, how our specific thing is that it's, it's post-ribosomal DNA and it's alternative splicing. So it might be slightly different than uh, having ribosomal DNA variations or not. So, but that could also be the case. I mean, that would be parallel to test, yeah. Thanks, Vasa. Here's a question for Terence, and I apologize, I'm not going to pronounce your name right, but from B. Haravi Shringeshwar. Um, they want to know the dose of NA and does dosing change depending on CAG repeat length? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. We are still trying to figure out dosing right now. Um, the doses that we picked for our initial studies were based on doses that we uh, found were non-toxic in cells, in culture. Um, but we think that we can actually go to higher doses in the mouse brain and it would be permissible. So we're doing those um, experiments right now. Um, does NA uh, depend on length of the CAG? We don't think so. As long as the repeat tract can form those structures, which NA binds to, it should be able to have effect regardless of how large the repeat is. I will say that NA does work better when you have increased levels of instability to start with because the same mechanisms that cause repeat expansion is what NA kind of takes advantage of to cause repeat contractions. Um, and so with a larger repeat, you're typically more unstable uh, and therefore NA should theoretically have a stronger effect there, but we haven't really tested that um, very, uh, we haven't tested the effect of length on NA sufficiency very carefully. Yeah. 
Thanks, Terrence. I think I'm going to adapt this first question for Issa. So this is from Herewig Lang. Will the involvement of glial cells be addressed? But I think I would add to that to ask um, how you think that mitochondria might be playing in a role in cell types other than MSNs. Uh, we know that mitochondria are dysfunctional in other cell types, but it's MSNs that are particularly vulnerable. So what do you think about the interplay between those? Yeah, no, it's, it's super well known that glia interplay uh, their metabolism with the neurons, especially through mitochondrial metabolism. Like if we look into the astrocyte neuron shuttle, like astrocytes connect with, with neurons and their mitochondria kind of connected metabolically. Um, so we don't have the tools to, to purify mitochondria from, for example, astrocytes. Um, there are genetic models that can be used for, for such purpose, but we are focusing on the MSNs in this, in this study, mostly from our previous studies in the lab doing uh, single, single nuclear RNA seq and also trap seq that also included the glia cells in that study. We've seen that the mitochondria is not as affected in those cells compared to the MSNs. The MSNs are really the big culprit here in terms of mitochondrial metabolism dysfunction. But it's Thanks, something Isa. that could be done in the future, but we're not uh, doing right now. Thanks, Isa. Um, so this is another question from Herewig to Terence. Can NA cross the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, it's a great question. And obviously it's really important in terms of um, pharmacology perspective, like how effective would it be if you do IV administrations? So we're doing those tests right now um, in a variety of different organisms. What I will say, so we don't have an answer for that yet. Um, but what I will say is that in HD, the blood-brain barrier is actually a little bit um, different. It seems to be a lot leakier. And so we are also wondering if maybe small molecules can enter the brain at a higher rate in HD relative to um, unaffected brains uh, through IV administration. That's something we're also testing. Yeah. Thanks, Terrence. And there's one last question um, for you, Terrence, from Mateus Dose. Did you test the effects of NA in wild type mice? Uh, yeah, we did. So we don't see um, that NA really affects wild type behavior or motor function in any way. And it doesn't seem to have any toxic effects. Um, in the brain either. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we are at exactly one o'clock. I am so impressed we got through all those questions. That was amazing. Um, I want to end by, again, thanking all of you so much for sharing your work with us. Uh, thanking our sponsors, Neurocrine Biosciences, Spark Therapeutics, and the Parvin Foundation, as well as everyone who has donated to the HDF. And to everyone who listened, thank you so much for joining our June webinar. Our next webinar will be in September. And we'll feature the work from our 2022 Nancy S. Wexler Young Investigator Prize winner, Dr. Natalia Barbosa. And she'll be speaking alongside her mentor, Dr. Judith Friedman. So stay tuned for more details for that. Uh, thank you all so much for joining and we hope to see you at our next webinar.